Hello, everyone. Welcome to Making the Shift. We are so excited today because we're getting together with my friend, Danielle Kent, who is also an SLP. And I was trying to remember how we met. I don't even know. So I had, I had, I had, a, I had a like burst of a thought bubble. I had connected with you somehow on Instagram and on your page, you mentioned co-regulation and you were the first person that had ever seen say anything about co-regulation. So I sent you, I think two copies of my book, Max Learns to Pause, because I was like, this is amazing. She's talking about this that I, nobody else is talking about. I love co-regulation. And I think it just kind of Snowballed. Oh my God. I forgot about that book. I went I back read that with the boys, with my boys. And you sent me two copies, which was so sweet. One for Connor and one for Tucker. I have two kids. I know like just being able to each have access in their own hands. Very important. Oh my gosh. I forgot you wrote a book. I can't believe I forgot that. And then we just started like becoming online best friends talking and dming sliding into each other's dms <laughs> yeah it just, yeah and i think i love to look back on it i always love to look back and think about the start and the evolution of friendships and relationships because it's a reminder that sometimes things take steam that you don't you have no idea that they will which is really cool yeah and we've talked about working together and we've definitely got stuff coming in the future i know it For and sure. Yeah, I asked Danielle to come on today because she is really the person I think about when we talk about the topic of co-regulation and self-regulation. And that's what we wanted to talk all about today is what is co-regulation and self-regulation, but really get into more of the why we really need to focus on co-regulation, even though people like to focus on self-regulation. But maybe you can tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So like you said, I'm a speech language pathologist. I'm also a mom of two, I guess four, including my two fur babies. But um, my journey towards understanding co-regulation really started at home. Um, Mm -hmm. I was noticing self-regulation differences in a lot of the kids that I work with, a lot of the kids who were autistic or had ADHD. But my own son had a much different time regulating than my daughter did. And, you know, still at that point, when I talked to his pediatrician, the approaches were very behavioral based. It was, oh, ignore, oh, withhold, oh, punish. And intuitively, I just thought those don't feel right. Just like at school, they never felt like the right approaches to support kids who were having a hard time. And so I read The Whole Brain Child and I never looked back. I never looked back from the reading of that book. And I think you and I have talked about that book before. And I just started diving extensively into this world of co-regulation and um, really that ability to support the child in front of you to develop self-regulation skills. And my son benefited tremendously. And I thought, hey, wait a minute, why aren't we taking the same information that we're really talking about to parents actively now and bring it over to the schools? Because the same principles apply to kids in schools. They need the same level of of responsiveness and attunement to develop their self-regulation skills. And that developed my love of talking about co-regulation to whoever will listen about it. (laughs) (laughs) And Danielle has done so many impressive things. I mean, she has a private practice. She does a ton of consulting with schools. She is the president of her state association for a little bit longer. And yeah, you're just, and you have a podcast too. Yeah, I do have a podcast. It was previously known as the Brainy SLP, but in really looking at who I want to be talking to with a podcast, it's getting transitioned to teaching and raising problem solvers. And really the heart of uh, self-regulation is the ability to problem solve. So just thinking about really teaching adults to understand self-regulation and prioritize connection and co-regulation. Yeah. So let's talk about maybe like some of the myths of self-regulation. Oh, this is so good. Um, This is so good because we hear it all the time. Um, Kids learn to develop self-regulation by themselves. Myth. That is, that is false. Yeah. Send them to their room and they will learn how to figure it out. Yes. Um, A big one that I've been working a lot with parents to carefully understand is this notion of calm down corners or quiet corners or anything like that. I think it's important to have a space in the house that maybe has reduced sensory input and you, my sensory SLP guru can talk on that, but the act of when kids are having a hard time, the act of being with them and supporting them to re-regulate is the most important thing we do versus saying, go calm down by yourself. Kids don't naturally have that brain wiring to do so. 
Oh my gosh. We just had a parent enroll in our program and she was saying that, um, the school just sends her son to like a room by himself, basically when he's really upset and they're having all these issues, like he was urinating on himself in the room. And it's like, yeah, because he doesn't want to be freaking alone, trapped in this room. He needs you there. He needs, you need somebody else. And I think that's, that's something I think we're really trying to make the shift of. And I acknowledge, and you acknowledge it too, how hard it is in schools right now with the staffing shortages and the crises that many schools are experiencing. And also these programs or these thoughts that we can send kids to a place by themselves to deescalate or calm down is sometimes dangerous thinking. It can actually lead to further isolation, shame, and further dysregulation cycles. Mm -hmm. And to break those, we really need compassionate, responsive uh, uh, adult relationships for the child. Yeah. I mean, I think as a parent, I know you've been through it too with your son. I have a son who's very sensitive and has big emotions. And I think sometimes the hardest part is you as a parent or the adult being able to show up regulated, right? I think like that calm down corner sometimes comes from a place of, well, I can't handle this right now. You go handle it on your own. Yes, totally. And you know, when parents tell me that I say, of course, their dysregulation trips your limbic system. Like you, you respond to your child in a caring way. And sometimes it's overloading and that's normal. So I always say like your regulation matters. Um, so, so we're not going to attune and respond all the time, hundred percent of the time, because we're humans, we're not robots and developing your own awareness of yourself and kind of how you are responding to your child's dysregulation, that awareness can be helpful. I was mystified for a while because at school, I can be working with kids who become significantly dysregulated and it didn't really flip my own limbic system the same way, but my son's dysregulation really comes after my limbic system. So I have to be really cognizant of how I'm feeling inside my body and what's happening for me when he becomes dysregulated. Yeah, that's such a good point. I feel the same in therapy. Um, but now it's like at home, I just am like, Chris, you handle this one. Okay, I'll be there in five minutes. Yeah, and it's it's great to have that type. If you're aware of it and you're like, hey, this is this is triggering for me, I'm gonna have a healthy response and say, I'm gonna step away for a second. That's an absolutely healthy response. It's also teaching your kids you have thresholds too. And you need time sometimes to regulate. You're showing them, you're modeling those self-regulation skills and then coming in to attune to them because you're now in a regulated place. Yeah, so let's talk about what co-regulation is. I feel like a lot of people don't even understand it or know how to explain it simply. Yeah, I always like to start with the inverse. What is self-regulation skills? Because co-regulation is supporting the development of self-regulation skills. And so I, I describe to adults, and, and I'd love for you to add on to any nuances that you describe, but self-regulation is really the ability to change or, you know, we say modulate your energy or emotional states to accomplish a goal, considering the social and physical uh, environment around you. So it's always about accomplishing a goal, um, considering the social and physical environment around you and the skills needed to do that. And that's the ability to self-regulate. Co-regulation is that warm, responsive relationship between an adult and a child to develop self-regulation skills. We think about that little tiny infant that has no ability to meet its own needs or regulate. They need to be changed. They need to be fed. Their temperature has to be adjusted. They have to be rocked. The adult has to attune, figure all that out, read their baby's cues, and meet their needs to help them regulate. And then this is hard for parents because there's no like real talk about this. Then gradually, as the child grows older, that responsibility gradually shifts to the child to learn how to regulate to accomplish a goal. And some brains need uh, more co-regulation time across time, and some brains need less, but all brains benefit from co-regulation support across time. Yeah, and the fact that, you know, people think, oh, they're graduating from co-regulating to self-regulating when in reality we use other people to co-regulate throughout our entire lives. All the time. And that's, that's a healthy thing. That's a healthy thing when we feel comfortable in, with the other people in our environment to call them up or show up to them and just say, I'm having a hard time. That's healthy co-regulation patterns. Developmentally, it's between um, a child and an adult, but in life, 
we all co-regulate adult to adult all the time in healthy relationships. Yeah. So I think about if you ever get in a fight or argument with your spouse and there's like the type of person that wants to avoid and walk away. Right. Or the person who's like really needs you. I'm that person. Like, do not leave me alone right now. Yes. I need you to co-regulate. It's like, no, I will never get over it if I am just by myself for the next 12 hours and sleep on it. But I guess that is also like a personal, well, that's more of maybe an attachment style thing. Also. Your attachment style. Absolutely. But all brains to some degree benefit from a level of support from another individual, another human to regulate throughout various seasons of their lives. But it may be consistent or it may be inconsistent, but there's a need at some point throughout a person's life. So I get this question a lot. I feel like you probably do too. What do you say to parents or teachers who ask when kids can start self-regulating? Yeah. And I love that question because we, we are really obsessed with markers. We're really obsessed with like, by when is this going to happen? You know what? Cause a lot of development, there's these rough milestones, you know, roughly potty trained around here, roughly first word here. The development of self-regulation skills is really individualized and unique. But what I like to say is starting with preschool and then above, we like to see a trend towards uh, independence or interdependence. Before preschool, kids have really emerging skills and benefit from more moderate support and really learning how to identify what's my energy state, what energy do I need, and what strategies could I use to accomplish the energy state that I need. Um, and I really use energy and emotional terms um, carefully because as you know, a lot of autistic adults share that emotional states can be hard to identify, but physiologically energy states can make sense. And so I always try and think about the language I'm using carefully so that it applies to the audience that's listening. Yeah, absolutely. And you bring up a great point about like from preschool on, you might see more development in these areas, but it's just so funny from Gosh, I know there was a study, I think it was more on impulsivity, where they were asking parents, what age do you think your child can like control their behaviors? And it was like 50% or something of the parents said by age two. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. And I think if you're not in education, you don't understand, you don't have the background of maybe understanding brain wiring and what's happening with your frontal lobe, your control center. I mean, a lot of, a lot of development happens, a lot of language happens. And so I think sometimes parents think, well, they have a lot of language, which must mean they have the ability to rationalize and control their actions. And it's kind of like, well, we're looking at two different skill sets that are connected, but also somewhat different in their development. Yeah, absolutely. I think about, gosh, let's talk about how we can help parents or therapists learn to help kids I, to co-regulate. Yeah, there's, there's like three pinnacles that I talk about with co-regulation that kind of help breaking it up. Providing a responsive attuned relationship where you're really learning to tune into the child in front of you and respond to whatever that is, respond to how they are as they are. Structuring the environment, providing an element of structure, consistency and rhythms and routines. And then teaching, coaching, and modeling self-regulation skills, really starting with a modeling early on, really modeling what self-regulation looks like. And then really as the child approaches three, four, uh, really starting to teach and coach those areas around self-regulation. Remembering always when a child is dysregulated, that's not the time to focus on teaching. It's the time to focus on supporting the child to return back to their optimal regulation state. Um, so that's the place I love to start. I love to start with success. You know, where, how is your child successful and, and what does it look like when they're regulated? So that's like a great place to start. And for parents who have kids who are struggling with their regulation, they often want to start with this regulation or when they're not regulated. But I always say, let's start with when and how they're regulated. How are they showing up and what do they look like? Yeah, I love that. Getting them to identify that. Yeah. And that's the basis of attunement, really learning to tune in. How are they presenting? And what that can help parents and professionals do is start to identify when the child is sliding out of regulation. And for some kids, it's really subtle. And for some kids, it's more pronounced. But the more attuned you are, the more likely you're to read the cues and can provide support for a strategy earlier than before the complete expo like explosion into hyper or hypo arousal. Um, 
So that's a great place to start. Think about what does regulation look like and really learning the skill of attunement to the child in front of you. Yeah. And that leads so much into what I talk about, like sensory regulation. You know, it's like, I talk about the sensory seesaw and it's like looking for those signs where it's starting to tip because instead of waiting for it to tip all the way. Um, and this, as you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, how much validation plays a role in helping kids regulate, because I just had this image in my head of, um, like a parent saying, calm down. Okay. So my mom used to say to Connor, every time he was upset, just calm down. And I'm like, he's not going to calm down. If you just tell him to calm down, like when you tell someone to calm down, it makes them do the opposite of calm down. You know, like that's not what he needs in that moment. Yeah. It's just like when somebody says to uh, somebody who's anxious, don't worry. It's like, if, if we could naturally just snap out of whatever it is, likely you would, you know, if you apply Dr. Ross Green's quote, kids do well if they can and doing well is preferable. We all want to do well, doing well is preferable. So when we're sliding out of that doing well or regulated place, it's normally not because we're wishing to do so. It's because we're having some type of response to something going on in our environment. Yeah, absolutely. So it's like, just, I feel like we have a lot of parents in the clinic, even who'll be like, okay, take a breath. You know, it's like, they're trying so hard. Would you, that fall into the coaching category? Yes. And I think take a breath. I love, I love strategies. I always start by like, just respond and attune to how they are. I mean, even without talking, just respond to tune and be present. You know, like I think that coast method I talk about a lot you know, if we think about the pinnacles of regulation, when a child is dysregulated, our focus is on that attuned responsive relationship. We're attuning to them, we're noticing them as they are, and we're going to meet them there. And then we're going to support them to return back to regulation. The best thing we can do sometimes is just to be present, to be yeah. present, just to offer some type of soothing response. I'm here for you. I'm listening. Very little. Some kids are, are receptive to strategies. This is knowing your child. Um, some kids really benefit from saying like, let's take some deep breaths. But I always say, put a we in it. Put a we in that regulation, that co-regulation, that responsiveness. Because when you say, let's take a few breaths or let's do this, it's you and me together. We're in this together versus you need to do this because you're dysregulated. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's like people want the black and white. Like they want the strategies but I'm like, I know that's what you want, but the answer is like, just be there, you know, for him, just like be that loving, warm, nurturing, supportive presence. Um, same. I don't, I usually tell parents, like, doesn't matter if you even say anything, you could just say, it's okay. You could say, I'm here, give him a hug, you know, and it's really like starts from there. Yes. And I think of, I always think about it as climbing the ladder, you know, you know, from the downstairs, to the upstairs brain. And that when you're downstairs, really just meeting and meeting, meeting you there. I think about even as adults, when I'm really upset. The most helpful thing for us is somebody saying like, just listening or just, I'm here for you. But when somebody says, you know, like, stop that, or it's okay, or it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Those are all invalidating and can just cause us to cycle, mm -hmm. <laughs> cycle more and more. And the same thing happens with our kids. Then they get stuck in dysregulation cycles. Will you briefly describe that? upstairs downstairs brain analogy from from the whole brain child and yeah. great analogy. the hand model of the brain the downstairs being our primitive brain which is our survival brain it's kind of how the brain comes wired for survival it's all of our survival functions essentially the four f's fight flight fright freeze uh fawn responses in response to stimuli and that's what we're born with. we're born to survive that upstairs is our control center or our thrival center that prefrontal cortex the very front part of our brain that develops last in our mid twenties. So think about our kids come wired with this survival center that's uh, kind of hyper responsive and a really underdeveloped control center up front. And so when kids are having a uh, survival response, we can be with them, meet them downstairs, be present with them and literally help them climb the stairs back up to their control center. Um, when we try and make them rush or jump, we often wind up going back to the survival center and triggering another dysregulation cycle. I love in that book, they describe it as it's like um, when some kind of big reaction happens, it's like the baby gate is shutting between the upstairs and the downstairs. And you can't even get upstairs to the logical decision-making center of the brain. It's like you are stuck kind of in that survival mode. You are stuck. You are stuck. And I, I've, been, I've been really perplexed at how, you know, co-regulation is so slow to catch on. 
But then I think about the wealth of information parents have had up until this generation about dysregulation being really purely behavioral and as an act of manipulation. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of this re revamping of understanding dysregulation is the drive, you know, drives what you do. It drives what I do. Um, it just helping people understand what dysregulation is and how kids can learn strategies. We're talking ripple effects for generations to come as we change this trajectory for kids. Absolutely. And it all starts with the hard work and people want to do what's easy, but this is like a prime example of something that it's the answer is like the fuzzy abstract thing to do, not the here black and white, super simple. Yes. Um, but I feel like you're trying to make that very easy for people to understand too, so that yeah. it, it doesn't feel overwhelming. That's, that's what I really hope to do is to provide really tangible insight into what's happening for kids and reframing maybe the information people have had to date and also cueing adults in, you know, how, what you believe about dysregulation matters here. So some of this is also looking at, okay, up to this date, even in graduate school, I was told when a child was having some reaction to ignore it, to turn away from it. And so even my training taught me these things to do when a kid was having a hard time. So I've had to undo all of that learning and then redo a lot of learning about how to respond to the child who's in front of me. Yeah, there is so much unlearning that comes right. with this. Yeah. Right, part of being human, I guess, being willing yeah. to unlearn and, and, and learn again, again exactly. and again. Exactly, oh my gosh, we could just talk forever on this topic. Um, it's been so great having you here and getting to share some strategies. So let's do some takeaways. Co-regulation, so important in the development of self-regulation. There is no self-regulation without co-regulation. And at least in our practice here, we work with a lot of little ones and we find that co-regulation is what we're focusing on. You know, I don't even think here we're at a point where we really focus on self-regulation too much. No, maybe you're modeling, maybe you're modeling it or coaching it sometimes, but I would say developmentally. And I always say, consider the development of the child, not the chronological age, but the development of the child. That's what's most important when we think about the, the supporting and the development of skills. Absolutely. So being there, being attuned, supportive, warm, nurturing, these are all ways to help a child co-regulate, just being that warm, loving presence and making sure you're regulated yourself. Yes. And asterisks, having compassion for yourself that you're not going to get it right all the time. That's just nature of being human. Um, and then just thinking ongoing about how you can be teaching and modeling those self-regulation skills. And that can be anywhere from, you know, solving a problem, helping your children learn problem solving language, making plans and play. Those are all things that get kids acting in a goal directed way. That's the heart of self-regulation. Yes. Oh my gosh. Problem solving is like big topic in our household. Huge. It's huge. Chris is the cutest with the boys when he's trying to help them solve problems. It's the best. I love it. Yeah, love such it. a good skill. Well, tell everyone where they can find you and learn more. So danielkent.com is my website at Miss Daniel Kent on Instagram. And I got on TikTok and then I was so overstimulated. I like haven't gone on <laughs> several days. So I might come back to there. My username is the same there. One day. That's what Chris <laughs> says. We're all moving over. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe not, maybe, but uh, for now, I'm really happy on Instagram. <laughs> and say your podcast name one more time. Teaching and Raising Problem Solvers. Awesome. We'll link to that too in our notes. Thank you so much for being here, Danielle. So great to have these conversations with you and just appreciate your time and getting to catch up. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Have a great evening.